Welcome back to the Congestion Reduction Training for MPO board members. I am your host, Wayne Garcia. This is the second of five separate modules in this training series. The module focuses on MPO responsibilities and authority under federal law and will provide you with a better understanding of what MPOs do and how they do it. Today, I'm joined by Jeff Kramer. He is a senior research associate at the Center for Urban Transportation Research. Thanks for being here again, Jeff. Thank you. Happy to be back. This training has been funded through the National Institute for Congestion Reduction and is being conducted by staff at the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. Additionally, the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, the National Association of Regional Councils, and the Florida Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory Council each contributed staff resources as a member of this project advisory committee, which provided guidance throughout the creation of this training series. All right, so let's dive right in on this discussion on MPO structure and function. By the end of this, I expect everybody watching will be an expert on what MPOs do and how they do it. Well, I don't know about being an expert, but everybody should have a pretty solid base on this subject. So let's start with the purpose of the MPOs. In the last module, we discussed the history of transportation planning, all the issues that the country was facing over time, and the varying perspectives on the interstate system, and which agencies should be involved in making transportation planning decisions. So what is the purpose of MPOs now? Well, it's written out in a federal statute in the U.S. Code and also in the Code of Federal Regulations, and it's to encourage and promote the safe and efficient management operation and development of surface transportation systems. You know, really, the purpose of the MPO is to oversee the development of transportation planning and programming in metropolitan areas. So when we're talking about all of this, we're including accessible pedestrian walkways, bicycle transportation facilities, intermodal facilities that support inner city transportation, you know, inner city buses, and you know, commuter van pool providers. I mean, really the range of surface transportation systems. They're also there to foster economic growth. If you remember from the last module, you know, the role of the federal government, what it saw itself in the very beginning, all the way back with the postal roads, was to, uh, was to support economic growth and development within the country. And, uh, and here, again, it's, it's still in the uh, purpose for the transportation program at the federal level, and MPOs are there to help foster that economic growth and development, both within and between states and urbanized areas. And it's also to better connect housing and employment. Also, you're supposed to be taking into account consideration for resiliency needs, which is a relatively new uh, issue. Think about sea level rise and uh, extreme weather events and a variety of other things that uh, that transportation uh, professionals need to be keeping in mind in, uh, on the existing system and how do we make it resilient um, while minimizing transportation-related fuel consumption and air pollution, things we talked about in the history of why MPOs exist, right? We talked about stagflation. We talked about oil embargoes and environmental impacts. Still thinking about that stuff to this day. So always a new challenge to have surface and deal with. But let's go back now. How does an MPO come into being? I mean, it's a federal requirement, if I remember, right? So what exactly is that requirement? Right. Well, so I think I mentioned in the last module that the first uh, federal law that created MPOs, the 1973 Federal Highway Act, said that there would be an MPO for every urbanized area, every metropolitan area of over 50,000 in population. So we have a map here, uh, just an example of metropolitan areas in, uh, in Colorado. And here we have seven urban areas over 50,000 in population. They look a little weird. The boundaries look a little strange. That's because it's based on the urban, uh, the census definition of an urban area. So it's not following political boundaries or you know, the county's boundaries or rivers or mountain ranges and less. And of course, those might result in dips in population density. That's why these things look kind of funny. 
Um, anyway, so any area of over 50,000 population must have or be part of an MPO, an MPO process. So, um, areas of 200,000 or more are designated as transportation management areas or TMAs. So you can see the grayed out uh, urban areas, those seven, uh, three of them are larger than 200,000. TMAs, for the distinction we make here, there's not much of a distinction, right? TMAs have somewhat more responsibility. They have somewhat more money, somewhat more authority, but for the general underlying uh, rules that MPOs have to follow, they're pretty much the same. And then MPOs are designated by agreement between the governor and the state, typically represented by the State Department of Transportation, and by the affected local governments. Really, the affected local governments representing 75% of the population within the urbanized area, uh, but typically it's all of the, all the local governments will, will be involved and they'll reach a formal agreement on what the boundary will look like. And so again, looking at this map, you can see that of the seven urban areas in this area of Colorado, they drew the map in such a way that there are three MPOs. One that's covering at the north end, uh, an MPO, uh, I'm sorry, an urbanized area, more than 200,000 in Fort Collins, and then the neighboring smaller urban area, and that's covered by the North Front Range MPO. And then the, uh, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, also known as Dr. Cog, um, covers four urban areas, three are smaller than 200,000, and Denver is the, you know, the Mac Daddy big urban area in, in, in that area. And then, uh, and then the Pike Peak, Pikes Peak urban, uh, Pikes Peak area cog is the MPO for the Colorado Springs urban area. So hopefully that gives you a sense of, uh, you know, why and how they are formed. Now that we know how MPOs are formed, can you tell me a bit about the key players in the MPO planning process? Yeah, so there's basically four categories of participants in the MPO process. They, um, they include the board members. And I, and I want to be clear here. I should, probably should have even said in the last uh, slide, MPOs by federal rule, by federal law, are called metropolitan planning organizations, but they are called other things across the country. Some are calling themselves TPOs, or transportation planning organizations. Some are called TPAs, transportation planning associations. Um, others are calling themselves, uh, you know, just by... Uh, individual decision, whatever fits in locally. So the MPO in Little Rock, Arkansas is Metro Plan, and that's it. The, uh, the MPO in Portland, Oregon is Metro. And gotcha. So some of them got them a branding consultant. That's right. It's branding. So anyway, so uh, the same way that MPOs, from the federal perspective, they're all MPOs. Whatever they're calling themselves, they're still MPOs. And Boards are the same. So the, the primary board, the one that makes the final decisions on everything coming out of an MPO, uh, is typically called a governing board. could be a policy board. Uh, some just call it the board. Uh, some call it the MPO board. Whatever name you use locally, I'm going to call it the board, right? So okay. board members are making decisions. They are supported. Their decisions are supported by an advisory committee structure and their members. Uh, depending on what uh, advisory committee we're talking about. MPO staff, and we're all staffed a little bit differently, uh, support that structure. And then, of course, the public and stakeholders are part of this process. And if you recall from our last module, ICE-T really upped the game for MPOs involving the public and stakeholders in that process. So let's start with the board then. Who serves on the board of an MPO? Okay, so if you're a TMA, the federal uh, rules, the federal law, uh, it says that you have to include three groups. Um, and those are local elected officials. And, and I want to be clear here, it's local elected officials from general purpose local government. So it's not your clerk of the court. It's not your supervisor of elections. It's a city or a county commissioner, councilman maybe a mayor, 
Uh, and then officials of public, I'm gonna read this, officials of public agencies that administer or operate major modes of transportation in the metropolitan area, including representation by providers of public transportation. Who is that? This is an airport, it's a seaport, it's an expressway authority, it's anybody operating um, a mode of transportation in the metropolitan area. They have to have a seat at the table. Okay. And then also appropriate state officials. There's no definition for that. So whatever appropriate state officials uh, is determined in, in, um, in your local area or perhaps by state law, that's who's going to sit on your MPO board. So you've shared a lot of great information with us so far. Where can the listeners to this look if they want to learn more about what the federal government says about MPOs? Well, it comes from the same place in the law that I mentioned at the beginning, a couple of few slides ago. Just look at Title 23 of U.S. Code, Section 134, or Title 23, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 450. So if you, you know, if you really, really want to know, know all about this, go read those things. And actually, depending on what state you're in, there may be state-specific laws that you need to look at as well. Some states don't discuss MPOs at all in state statute. Uh, other states, including the state we're in here, where we're recording this today in Florida, has very extensive uh, laws pertaining to MPOs. And of course, your MPO staff can help you reach all of that detailed information should you really want to take that deep dive. That's right, that's right. So something new under um, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act IIJA, uh, which is the newest federal reauthorization of the of the of the federal transportation law, uh, says that in designating officials or representatives for the first time. So this is when you have a new urban area, and you have to have an MPO that'll cover it. That they need to consider the equitable and proportional representation of the population of the metropolitan planning area. So here, for new MPOs. You have to take into account where do people live, not just here's our board, we're covering this whole area, but you need to make sure that the board is representative in some fashion of the population of that metropolitan area. And again, that, that idea is to make sure that everybody feels they have a seat at the table and their voice is heard even if they don't prevail in a decision, let's say, at least they were there in the room. Right, that's the idea of MPOs in the first place. So you mentioned a second ago that these rules governing the makeup of MPO board membership were specifically for TMAs, those larger areas. But what about non-TMAs? How do they determine the makeup of their MPO board? Well, you know, for non-TMAs, federal regulations are silent on the issue. They can feel free to create it uh, the way they want to. But many non-TMAs simply follow the guidelines for TMAs. So mostly a local elected officials Mostly, if you have a transit operator in the system, uh, uh, in the metropolitan area, they would have a seat at the table. If you had an airport, they would have a seat at the table. But they might also add institutions like universities or a military base. Um, and, and so uh, they might tailor it to choose to, uh, uh, to represent local planning needs as well. And of course, as I mentioned before, state rules apply here. So again, just uh, my own local knowledge of Florida, MPO boards have to be between five and 20, and no more than 25 members. How they chose that number, I don't know, but they did. Uh, county commission members need to be at least a third of the MPO board structure. Some states don't have any rules at all, so they're free to do whatever they want. If you're a non-TMA, you're really free to do whatever. So check on your state requirements as well, because uh, you may not be here in Florida where we are right now. That's right. So can you talk a little bit more about the role of the MPO board in the overall process of this thing? Right. So, you know, the board is there to set the big picture frame. You're going to set a vision for what you want the metropolitan area to look like. Uh, you're going to establish goals. And then your committees and your staff are going to help you try to advance 
whatever activities the MPO is undertaking to achieve that vision and goals. That's, that's what they're there for. Also, board members make planning and programming decisions. So they have direct authority over MPO plans and programs, and we'll talk about those in a few slides. And, but they're also there to discuss and vet other agency planning and programming decisions. So you might not have authority over what the airport's going to do, what the DOT is going to do, what the city is going to do, what the, you know, the seaport's going to do. But to the extent that it impacts the surface transportation system, you have every right to be involved in that decision-making process and to have that conversation. So I'd like to say here that in some ways, MPO influence is bigger than MPO authority, right? You can have that discussion even if you don't have direct authority over those decisions. I love that characterization. I think it really sets uh, an understanding of where these ideas and directions, you know, sort of bleed out from the edges of authority into the larger public discussion and the way other people behave. So um, in that list of people who are engaged in the MPO process next was the advisory committee. Um, how are they constituted and what do they do? So federal law is pretty quiet on that. In fact, it doesn't talk about advisory committees, but just says you can have them. So uh, they're there to provide input to the MPO board. So think of it this way. The, the board should be making final decisions, but they need input, right? They need to know things. And Advisory committees are there to provide them with that kind of input, whether it's technical analysis or specialized knowledge. So some MPOs might create uh, committees that focus on economic activity or freight movement or transportation operations, or uh, I think there's an MPO here in Florida that has an aesthetic review committee. And so they look at everything that transportation agencies in the area are producing from an aesthetic perspective doesn't match the community character. And also many MPOs have a citizen's advisory committee. So they're getting input from a citizen's perspective. So they're all there and established by the MPO board through their bylaws, but it's all for input. It's also that the, the policy board, governing board, can make better decisions. So um, here's some examples of committees. And I mentioned the Aesthetics Review Committee. Mo a lot of MPOs have Citizens Advisory Committee. Almost all MPOs that I'm aware of have a Technical Advisory Committee. They may call it something else. Mm -hmm. But this is going to be uh, the, the professional planners, engineers, public works. Uh, maybe your first responders might be on there maybe somebody from the university or a military base uh, will be on that technical advisory committee. Many MPOs now have bicycle and pedestrian advisory committees to focus on those aspects of uh, surface transportation. Um, that, that's it, part of the system. Uh, transportation disadvantaged advisory committees will be looking at issues related to the American uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and how to disadvantaged uh, uh, members of the community, disabled members of the community, uh, how do they uh, provide mobility and access to those? Some have freight advisory committees. Really the limit is uh, whatever your staff can support, whatever time you have, how much money it's going to cost to have uh, all these committees. And, but the MPO board in the end has to see value in those committees. And it's up to them to decide what committees they have. Of course, we know how important staff is to the functions and success of any agency. And I'm sure that's true for MPOs. And I know many of the people watching this who have their own staffs at their local governments or state governments or agencies um, understand that as well. What is the role of professional staff in the MPO? You know, I have a list here. Right. And this is their job. They, they provide information and technical support. They prepare documents. They foster you know, interagency coordination with those cities and counties and the other agencies. They 
they manage that public engagement process we talked about a little bit, and uh, they hire consultants if they need it uh, to do maybe some specialized work, and they, they basically manage the planning process. But your staff is not recognized in federal law. Your board is. So the board recognizes MPOs as the policy board, as the governing board, and staffing kind of up to the MPO. And so it's really resulted in there's over 400 MPOs in the country, and they're staffed in a variety of ways. So they might be staffed by a local jurisdiction. So sometimes the staff are both county planning staff or city county uh, planning staff, and they're also MPO staff. And others are freestanding agencies. The staff is only working for the MPO. And we got a couple of other uh, quirky things out there. Some MPOs are staffed by their local COG or an RPC, a uh, regional planning commission, or some equivalent regional planning body. Um, we've got one in northern New Jersey that's actually staffed by the New Jersey Institute of Technology. So they actually have university staff providing uh, staffing. It's really up to the local context and you know how that staffing agreement will be worked out. And again, in all, in all of this stuff about the MPO process, there's um, that a lot of freedom to constitute what works best or is needed in your local area. Yeah, that's right. But just remember, regardless of who the staff is or who the arrangement for providing staffing services is, these things on this uh, screen, the these bulleted items, we all have to do it. We all have to do the same thing. So it really doesn't matter who's providing the staffing. The staffing is still there to support the decisions being made by the MPO governing board. Okay, so now in that list, we get to the last one, which is the public generally, and subsets of the public we call stakeholders. So what is their role? Right, so uh, again, as I mentioned, Ice-T really kicked up the game uh, for MPOs to engage the public in making uh, their decisions. And stakeholders, look, you can look it up in a dictionary. It's really anybody who has a share or an interest in something in the outcome of transportation decisions. So uh, of any decision, in this case, transportation decisions. And look, the MPO is looking at a number of things. They're planning for the whole surface transportation system in the metropolitan area. So who's a stakeholder? Well, anybody who drives, anybody who walks, anybody who, who <laughs> is riding a bike, uh, but also institutions are stakeholders. So maybe you're a large church, maybe. Uh, and so they have an interest in the roadway network and the, and the, and the transit network to be able to deliver uh, accessibility and mobility services to their, to their flock. And also to come to church on Sunday or, you know, synagogue Friday, uh, Friday night, if you're not Orthodox and um, you know, um, but also uh, amusement parks, uh, universities, they're all stakeholders, right? Generators of uh, people coming and going. So that's the role of a stakeholder to, to try to engage and the role of the MPO to try to get stakeholders to engage in their processes so they're making better decisions uh, with that kind of input. So what possible stakeholders uh, might there be? You know, I'm just gonna roll out a few, a few examples yeah. here, um, you know, it could be business and industry groups. The state DOT is certainly a stakeholder in the MPO process. Neighboring MPOs where uh, people commute back and forth between boundaries, that's, you know, uh, their stakeholders in your decision-making process. Uh, affordable housing organizations, trucking and freight hauling. I'm not going to read the whole list, but I'm just telling you, it's pretty extensive, and the and more could have been, like, 17 more slides, right? So it's basically different in every metropolitan area's own context, right? The business community is probably going to exist in every place, but not every place is going to have, say, a federal park, but some do, and they're stakeholder. So you need to pay attention to that. As it relates to the relationship between the public and the MPO, are, are you talking about informing the public about the work of the MPO, or is it something more? 
Yeah, it's definitely something more than that. So there's a distinction between public participation and public information. So public participation is much more than providing information. Public information is, you know, uh, giving the public information they need to understand the agency decision-making process. So it's one directional, right? It's the agency providing information to the public. But public participation is more. It is providing the public with multiple and often ongoing opportunities to, uh, to receive information from the agency, from the MPO, and then to be able to provide input as decision-making progresses. And so it's interactive, it's two-directional, and the MPO provides information it receives its input, it needs to consider that input in making planning and programming decisions. And in fact, it needs to demonstrate in its uh, documentation that they heard what the public had to say and that they acted on it in some way. Now, it doesn't obligate the NPO to do what every member of the public says it, they think that should happen because you, you couldn't do it. You'd just yeah. be frozen and you have a lot of as we talked about in the previous module, uh, you've got a lot of different perspectives on what should be done. But that doesn't mean that the MPO shouldn't be considering those perspectives and then saying, here's what we did with your information. So I got gotcha. you. But earlier in our conversation, you referred to planning and programming. And are those two different activities? Yeah, they sure are. So planning, planning is setting a strategy for meeting a desired outcome, achieving a goal. So it's long-term. It's what do I want to be when I grow up, right? Yes. So planning is like, what do we want this metropolitan area to be years from now? And well, what am I going to do to get there? What strategies am I going to use to get there? Programming is the implementation of that plan. So it's scheduling work in a much shorter time frame and assigning available funds to implement planned projects and activities. So where the plan uh, and the planning activities might be looking at 20 plus years, the program's much shorter. Uh, you have a much higher degree of, of uh, confidence in how much money is actually available to do what you want to do. And you're also much more specific on the types of projects or the, the actual individual projects and activities that you want to spend that money. So I think we've covered the players in all of this really well for our viewers. So tell me more. Let's pivot back to the overall work of the MPOs. How does that happen? Yeah, so I think of it this way. There are basically three very broad responsibilities for an MPO. First is to manage the three C decision making process. We'll talk about that in a few slides, but I've talked about it as part of the last module. Um, so this was what was created in the 62 Federal uh, Highway Act, uh, and it predates even MPOs. Uh, the MPO also is the lead planning agency for metropolitan decision-making in its metropolitan area, and then they're responsible for coordinating transportation programming in that metropolitan area. And remember the distinction between planning and programming we just talked about. So they have these three, look, is every activity neatly fit into one of these three? No, a lot of it bleeds across, but I like you to think about whatever your MPO is doing, which one or more of these broad responsibilities does that activity fit into? So I know uh, in the history module, the previous module that um, you all would have watched, we talked a lot about the 3C process and that Congress required that long before it created the MPOs. So it, let's have a quick review exactly what is the modern 3C process and why is it really important to this whole thing? Right. So it's, it's in the, like I had mentioned before, it's in the code, federal code, and it's in the um, U.S. code. And it's the process to provide for consideration of all modes of transportation. Remember, it's 3C, continuing, cooperative, and comprehensive. So 
it's that ongoing discussion, if you will, about transportation in the metropolitan area. What does that look like? So continuing, and if this is, you know, this, this idea has remained the same, but sort of expanded over time, right? So it's, it's not that different from when they first created it in the 60s, but it's grown because, well, let's face it, our transportation system has grown. It has changed. It's morphed. So plans are to be dynamic and periodically changing to reflect changing conditions and priorities. So it's continuing because our system's not static. And so now we have to take into account uh, autonomous vehicles, potentially. We have Uber and Lyft drivers driving around out there. So what do we need to do to plan for that? Um, and so if you had a long range plan and you adopted it, well, then what, right? So you, you need to be continuous. You need to continue to think about things, continue to grow, continue to evolve. Um, it's comprehensive. And I really mean it's all modes, all issues. We talked about civil rights. We talked about the environment, but we also are talking about transit, buses, light rail vehicles, walking, biking, riding electronic scooters. I was going to say all the way down to those little rental scooters I see all oh, over the place. And the and the bikes you can rent, mm -hmm. right? You got to take an, into account. So that's comprehensive. And then it's cooperative. So it involves all the jurisdictions and agencies responsible for or impacted by transportation decision-making. Now, remember, the MPO board itself is cooperative in the sense that you have representatives from probably most of the jurisdictions in your area. So you have members of city councils and county commissions and mayors who may not all agree on what's the most important thing to do. You also have modal providers represented on the MPO board um, and, and uh, appropriate state officials also participating. But that's also all those stakeholders we talked about. So it's cooperative in the sense that the MPO board in the end is making a final decision about something, but they're supposed to be collecting input from everybody. So it's cooperative. So the 3C process was created uh, in part to deal with the conflicts that arose over all these transportation projects that people had different views about. So how are MPOs today supposed to help address and resolve that conflict? Well, you know, like I just said, all those various stakeholders and all the members of the board and all the transportation partners that MPOs have to interact with, this is a place for all those voices to be heard. And that's, that can be messy. Sure. But it's part of getting everything out on the table, right? So that when decisions are made, nobody should be able to say they didn't have an opportunity to engage in the process. Doesn't mean that they got their way. It means that they had a chance to participate, right? So this is the place, the forum for the voices to be heard. And how do you fulfill that responsibility? It's by providing a structure that ensures lots of input, lots of education, and discussion. So if the airport is considering to do something, maybe they're going to, I don't know, uh, expand a runway, uh, add more flights. They're expanding the rental car fleet. Well, the MPO doesn't have authority over that, but all those cars or maybe the additional transit riders are going to end up on they the- They got to go somewhere. They got to go somewhere. So they're going to end up on the surface transportation system someplace. So it's, it's a fine venue for the MPO to say, hey, airport, come talk to us about this. We might have some opinions. We can't tell you what to do, but we're going to tell you what kind of impact you're going to have on our system, or we want to better understand what kind of impact you're going to have on the system. This is the place to have that discussion. So that's how it does it, by inviting people to come talk, by reaching out to people to talk to them, by attending their meetings, by having them come attend your meetings. That's how it's done. So one of the things that struck me earlier that you said was that transportation must also consider other policy concerns. Uh, what are those concerns? Yep. So in the last module, we talked about the civil rights movement. We talked about oil embargoes. We talked about 
stagflation. Uh, all the good old days. All the good old days. Well, that stuff continues, right? It's not like that mm -hmm. stuff's gone away. So we still need to be considered uh, civil rights. Uh, we hear much more discussion now about it in terms of equity and the provision of uh, environmental justice uh, in decision making. Remember, this is all driven by uh, by the federal rules, right? And the federal government implements its policy goals through the provision of federal funds and putting rules on those. So you focus on civil rights, you focus on environmental impacts and preservation, but you know we got a lot of other types of planning activities that are affected by transportation in the area. So we're you know we're we're talking about uh, things like the electrification of our vehicles and are we going to provide an infrastructure uh, that'll support electric vehicles in the future? What about autonomous vehicles? What about those electric scooters you want to talk about? Um, we've got some concerns about uh, how people are getting around, but also how does that affect people's ability to move and how does it affect uh, various communities in the in the uh, in your metropolitan area? Uh, and the NPO needs to try to take into account all those things. Things like the price of gas. And what does it have? What about the pandemic? We saw a, a great decline in vehicle miles being driven. And then we've seen an increase over time uh, as that's passed. So uh, what impact does that have on the transportation system? And, so it all needs to be taken into account. And so those are among the broad responsibilities of MPOs to take into account those issues. I hear that list uh, that you had about all those other concerns about being a, about the outcomes of the planning and programming work. Are there also process requirements? Yeah, so uh, it does need to be open, public and inclusive. So, you know, you need to be holding the meetings when people can get to them, stuff like that. And it needs to be, people need to be able to be informed. Um, and you have to consider a variety of planning factors that are in federal law. So I was talking uh, in the last slide about uh, civil rights and equity and, and a variety of other things, uh, the, the economy, of course, always. Um, that need to be taken into account. But federal law does include some specific planning factors, and we'll go over those now in a, a little more detail. Okay. Um, so first, planning factor in federal law, and, and it's, this is the shorthand. If you want to go read it, there are whole paragraphs dedicated to each of these. I'm not going to bore anybody with all that detail. But basically, uh, the federal government maintains its position on economic vitality. So the NPO needs to always be mindful of economic, uh, the economic health of it, the community uh, in its planning and programming processes. And they need to be very specific and document, here's how we're considering these things. So all these planning factors in the documents that we'll talk about later in this module need to be identified specifically. How are you dealing with economic vitality? Second is safety. And I'm gonna talk about safety and security a little bit together because they sound kind of like the same thing, right? But safety is, is about crashes. It's about um, uh, safety on the transportation system and safety of the transportation system versus security, which might be crime uh, in transit stations. It might be um, security in terms of like hurricane evacuation, or uh, if we want to go all the way back to the to the original reason for the interstate system, evacuating urban areas in the event of a nuclear uh, a nuclear war, which seems less likely now, but more likely that you're having some large weather event that you maybe need to evacuate urban areas for. So those things uh, relate to safety and security, uh, accessibility and mobility options. So we want to be looking at uh, who is able to access what in the community? So maybe elderly citizens 
and their access to medical uh, facilities? And what mobility options are we providing them with? They can't all drive, maybe. Mm -hmm. So they got other options. Uh, people who don't drive, people who are too young to drive, people who, through whatever physical limitation, can't uh, drive themselves. What other mobility options are we providing? What kind of accessibility are we providing for our uh, residents? The residents, and frankly, in a lot of places, we are caring also about uh, tourists. We're caring about visitors and not just residents. Uh, planning factors also include, this is a, uh, you know, you look at this one, this is how it's written in law, the environment, energy conservation, quality of life, planned and growth, planned growth, housing, economic development. So that's a kind of a multi-part planning factor. So that's a big list. But, yeah. I, but I look at that as like, you know, what's, what's the quality of the community you're living in, right? So all these things related to uh, community quality and you know, living standards, basically. And then the integration and connectivity of the transportation system. So I had mentioned at some point the term intermodal. Yeah. Um, so are we integrating and connecting our various transportation systems so that they uh, are working well together? Uh, can you get off the bus and... Uh, and take your bike and go somewhere? Take your bike and go somewhere. Great example. So uh, something like that. And then... Uh, we're also looking the efficient movement of operation and operation of the system. So, so really, we're looking at here how are we getting, how are we maximizing the system we already have instead of spending a whole lot of money building something new. How can we get more out of what we've already spent? I don't even know how much money, right? Yeah. So much money over the last fifty years on the interstate system on light rail systems, on heavy rail systems, on uh, bus systems, on sidewalks, and so on. Let's maximize these things. Let's take care of these things. And so that goes along with the eighth planning factor, which is preserving that system. So let's make sure we're preserving that system. It's not just being efficient and effective and maximizing the capacity of that system, but making sure we don't lose that system, right? And then system resiliency. We talked about that a little bit uh, before. You know, how are we going to be making sure that the system we have uh, continues into the future? Or do we have areas of our system that uh, of our system that are uh, potentially impacted by sea level rise, or by hurricane damage, or by um, rock slides, or mud flows, or fire? Uh, depending on what part of the country we live in, what kind of disaster we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe large snowfalls. So, and then specifically, Congress wants us to focus on travel and tourism. So, um, so not just focusing on the needs of our population, but the needs of our visitors as well. So, when we talked about reauthorization legislation since Ice-T in the history module, I think you highlighted a new focus, uh, something about performance. What does that mean? Right. So under MAP-21, one of the more snappy, I think better acronyms that they came up with, uh, about a decade ago, the idea came out uh, to provide some increased focus on a really a few important functions of the system through required target setting and measurement. Uh, they focus on uh, these, these few uh, performance uh, measures, focus on both the physical condition of the transportation infrastructure, but also on the performance of transportation systems, some of them including congestion reduction. So, um, you know, I think this was a, an idea borrowed from the private sector. Uh, they yeah, often measurable say, outcomes. Measurable outcomes. What you know, well, do you do what you measure, right? Or you focus on what you measure. So Congress established goals, what performance measures, it, it, uh, performance goals it wants us to achieve. USDOT established the measures, then MPOs and state DOTs are responsible for setting targets and for keeping track of those targets, monitoring the system to see how they're doing against the targets that they've set. 
So here they're trying to identify the criteria, it's Congress and the USDOT, against which the transportation planning process should be evaluated, and then providing the grounds for prioritizing projects as it relates to those things. And so here's a few subset of the federal performance measures that are related specifically to congestion reduction. And we're looking at the percent of person miles, and that's a very technical term, right? People moving versus vehicles moving, uh, traveled on the national highway system. So that's the interstate and a handful of other high-level uh, roadways uh, that are reliable. Um, and we'll talk about reliability at, at some point during this, um, during this series, but basically that's, that's how reliable is my ability to get from point A to point B on the system. And then they're also looking at truck travel time reliability. And that's an index actually. And then annual hours of peak hours, so think rush hour, right, uh, of delay per person, per capita, and then the percent of non-single occupant vehicle or SOV travel. So that's a measure of, of travel by any, any particular mode that isn't one person driving themselves in a car. I'm assuming that all of this work leads to the production of something. And so do, do MPOs build roads or bus lanes or train stations or any of that kind of stuff? What exactly do they produce? So, so they do not build roads. They do not, they're not in the construction business, right? Okay. So MPOs plan and they program. So this is the base. This is what's federally required for MPOs to produce. They are required to produce a metropolitan transportation plan. Like MPOs, like the board, this also goes by other names in other states. So you may hear it referred to as the Law Range Transportation Plan. You may hear it referred to as the MPO plan. Uh, in federal law and rule, they refer to it as the Metropolitan Transportation Plan or the MTP. So that's the term I'm gonna use here. But uh, if that's not the term used locally, just know it's the same thing. I'm talking about the same thing. It's your plan, whatever that is. Okay. Um, there's the Transportation Improvement Program. This goes by the acronym TIP or TIP. You'll hear both used. As far as I know, that's the only term used across the country. So TIP and TIP. So that's the implementation part of the, of the um, MPO responsibility. So the TIP implements the plan, right? Uh, the Unified Planning Work Program. I have heard this referred to as the UPWAP. I'm not going to refer to it that way. Uh, but it is, uh, uh, and we'll describe that in a few slides, uh, but you can think of it real shorthand as the MPO's budget. Uh, a public participation plan, this is related to your public engagement, and then a congestion management process, or a CMP. And you'll note the little asterisk there. This is only required by, uh, for TMAs, unless it's also required by state law for other MPOs. So we'll get into each of these in the next few slides. So I was gonna say, that's a good idea. Let's tackle them one at a time. Let's start, what is the MTP? Right, so back when we were defining planning, we said that this is, uh, this is the way that the MPO policy board, the governing board, gets to decide what do we wanna look like when we grow up, right? Looking way into the future. So. This is a, a federally required, and I, I want to step back just a second. That list of, of federally required um, documents, the MTP, the TIP, and so on, think of that as the floor. That is what you have to do. That's the minimum. It's not the maximum. You do a whole lot more than that, and we'll get to that, but that's the floor. So with the MTP, this is your comprehensive transportation plan for the MPO area. It's got to consider all modes and all those planning factors we talked about in mm -hmm. federal law. So a lot of MPOs, you're going to see a matrix that says, okay, planning factor one, economic vitality. How does this plan address economic vitality? You might have a matrix that says this, this, and this, and this, and this 
do that, uh, address that, that particular climate topic. So it also incorporates a vision for the region and policies and operational strategies and even projects to get there. So, you know, it's that long range, here's what we're going to be when we grow up, and here's what we're going to do to get there. Here are the goals, here are the objectives we're going to set aside for that. Um, so it needs to be at least 20 years uh, looking forward. So it's got a 20-year horizon. Some MPOs do a long-range plan that's longer than that, but most MTPs at a minimum are 20 years some longer. It's updated at least every five years. So remember, I was talking about continuous, right? Mm -hmm. As part of the three C's. So if you just adopted an MTP and then just left it on a shelf and never updated it again, well, you'd really be missing an opportunity to reflect on the changes in, uh, in your metropolitan area. And so you're going to update it you know, Congress says, look, we can't, it can't be just sitting there. So you got to update it every five years. It has to be affordable with reasonably expected resources. And what does that mean? It's fiscal constraint. It's cost feasible. It's cost affordable. You're going to hear all those terms. It's the cost feasible plan. It's the cost affordable plan. It's under fiscal constraint. What it means is it can't be a wish list. It can't be just... Here's everything I need and want to do in the metropolitan area. To Without choose. any hope of funding ever coming through at ever, that level. Ever, exactly. So every MTP is going to include an estimate of the revenue that can be reasonably expected uh, for making transportation improvements in your metropolitan area. And then the projects that are going to be considered and included and the strategies and the activities that will be in the MTP will have to fit under, under that amount of resources you think will be available. That's hard. That's hard. Every, every place. I'm not going to say maybe there's an MPO out there that, that has all the money it needs to do everything it needs to do. But by and large, the vast majority of MPOs don't have enough money or can't reasonably expect enough money to do everything they think they need to do. And so it's up to the MPO board to make hard decisions. What's in the cost affordable plan, in the cost feasible plan, if maybe that's the term you use, and what's not. And then it's performance-based. So, okay, stop for a second. What do you mean performance-based? Right. So it means that everything in your plan, you need to justify it against or demonstrate how it is advancing you toward those goals that you were setting under the federal government's rules. So I, I showed you a short list of some that are related to congestion. There's others that are related to pavement and bridge, uh, uh, you know, bridge construction, or not construction, but integrity mm -hmm. um, and safety, uh, several. And so in your MTP, you have to demonstrate that your MTP is going to get you toward achieving your goals. You have to say, here's what the target is. But, you know, the federal planning factors are just what you're required to do by the federal law. Many MPOs set other targets in other areas. And then they measure themselves against those things. As we said, you do what you're measured. Uh, you do what is being measured, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so some MPOs go well beyond the federal performance uh, management targets. But that's what I mean by performance-based planning. And you'll see when we talk about the TIP programming as well. Well, so speaking of the TIP, that's the second thing in the list here. So uh, how is that different from the MTP? So I mentioned in the definition, planning and programming, the, T the TIP implements uh, projects that are projects and activities, I should say, and services, because it's broader than just projects, right, uh, that are funded in the MTP. And I would add here, too, the real importance of this. Remember, MPOs exist by federal rule. To do what? To have a role in spending federal transportation dollars. So if a project 
or a, a service or an activity does not appear in the MTP, then in the TIP, either specifically or by reference, it is not eligible for federal funding. So this is the this is the key to the MPO's authority, right? Both the MTP and the TIP can't spend federal money on a project, which is a lot, uh, unless it appears in there. Okay, so the TIP, there's several requirements in federal law. And let's add also, could be in state law too, as we said before, look at your state law, what else is it requiring? Um, that relates to all these projects, right? All of these projects. Uh, projects, but uh, these plans and programs. Uh, look at your state law too. But in federal law, it covers a period of no less than four years. Could be longer. And it must be updated at least every four years. Well, that's not an accident because uh, if you didn't update it every four years, it would expire, mm -hmm. right? It, you'd be in a fifth year and you wouldn't have had a, you know, TIP only covers four years. So you got to update it before it expires, right? Before it runs out. It must be affordable with reasonably expected resources. This is cost affordability, you know, fiscal accountability, right? It's, it's, it's cost feasible. Um, so it's the same concept as we discussed with the MTP, only now it's like, what are we spending money on next year, not 20 years from now, right? So you really, really do have to have a really strong sense that the revenue that you uh, expect will be available to program something in your TIP uh, that you'll be able to afford it, basically. Can we really do it? And then it's performance-based, no different than the MTP. You're going to describe your targets, and you're going to uh, just, uh, show or demonstrate in this document how does this mix of services, mix of projects, help us achieve the targets that we've set. Um, you know, and that's uh, and that's got to be laid out here. And so, pub, you know, Congress wants you to be able to say, "Here's how we're doing," and you got to demonstrate this to the public and the stakeholders. Right? This is a uh, advertising, if you will. Hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what we got planned in the MTP. Here's what we're doing in the next four to four or more years. Here's where we're spending our money, and here's that, how it's going to help us achieve. Our targets. So the next in that list, the Unified Planning Work Program. Right. So, you know, the, U, the UPWP, Unified Planning Work Program, is a document planning and programming uh, work to be conducted in the MPA. Wait, 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 wait. What's an MPA? I've, we've all this alphabet soup, that's the first time I've heard an MPA. Yeah, I think I've mentioned uh, Metropolitan Planning Area. That's what I'm talking about, MPA. Uh, so the MPA, remember our, our map from Colorado, the MPA is the area within the boundary of the Metropolitan Planning Organization. So the MPA is the area that the MPO has responsibility for, planning, and programming, transportation projects, services, and activities, both in the short run through the program and in the long run through the plan. I got gotcha. you. MPA. Yep. So um, you can think of it in three ways. Uh, probably most people would recognize it as the budget instrument for the MPO. So back in the history module, I talked about PL funds. These are the federal planning dollars that are coming down to the MPOs so that they have some independence from the state and local jurisdictions. So they got some of their own money to do these uh, things that they're required to do. And they're going to uh, say, here's how we're spending that in the UPWP. So it's a budget document, but it's also a strategic document in the sense that what is the staff doing? What are we paying consultants to do? What plans are we doing? What documents are we developing? What studies are we performing? What uh, data are we collecting? It should all be strategic in that, how does this advance the vision in the MTP? 
how does this help us get the projects funded and uh, and implemented in our TIP, right? So it's a fair question for an MPO policy board member to say, okay, there's something here in my UPWP. I don't know why we're spending money on this thing. Ask your staff. I'm sure there's a really good reason why, but it's a fair question. Uh, so think of it as strategic from that. It's not a strategic plan, but it is a strategic document in that it should be advancing the vision in the end of the MPO for its metropolitan area or MPA. Um, so comprehensive document, it is also a comprehensive document in that it's supposed to be showing transportation planning activities being conducted by other agencies in the metropolitan area. So if the transit agency is doing a study or a plan, if the airport is doing it, if the state is doing it, if the city or county is doing it, it should be reflected just for informational purposes here in the UPWP. And so we come to the public participation plan. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure I understand this one. This is how the public participates in all of this, right? Yeah, that, that's right. So it's a plan to ensure really broad public participation in the MPO's process and for documenting those activities and their results. So it's a little bit broader, um, you know, in, in that it's, um, it's trying not only to say how are we engaging the public, but it's also supposed to document well, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to reflect it in other things? And how are you going to monitor that you're doing what you say you're going to be doing? So federal law, the federal rule, outlines several uh, requirements for the public participation plan. First, you have to provide adequate public notice uh, for, for your activities and a time for public review and comment at key decision points. So as you're updating your MTP, you know, when are you going to be noticing the public that you're doing this and giving them opportunity to come in and comment at, you know, particular stages of the plan. Not just, here's the plan, what do you think? We're all done, right? Bringing them along as the process, I uh, recall, uh, uh, carries out. And then uh, you're supposed to be using visualization techniques to the, give the public a, a clear understanding of what's being considered in the MTP and the TIP. So, it could be something very sophisticated. I guess it could be Legos or Tinker Toys if that's what you want to do. But it's got to be in a way that, uh, you know, it can't just be a list of, just a list of projects, right? It, you, they've got to be able to visualize it. Where in the, maybe maps, right? Or Yeah, because many in the public are not real sophisticated in transportation planning and may not even know where you're talking about. That's right. That's right. And you also have to make public information available both in person and online. Because some members of our community are not connected to the, to the internet. So how are they going to know? Uh, others are, and they don't want to go to some central repository to read a document. They want to be able to see it on the internet. So you got to do both. Um, you got to seek out and consider the needs of uh, communities that are traditionally underserved by our existing transportation systems. So, uh, and that's a broad range, but, you know, falls within the category of civil rights or environmental justice, but even uh, children and elderly and other communities that, that are traditionally underserved. Um, so you need to make a specific point in documenting your public participation plan. How are we going to reach out to these communities? Um, you're supposed to hold public meetings at convenient and accessible locations and times. So is a meeting at noon downtown city hall convenient or accessible to the public and is it a good time well for some people it is but maybe not for the whole community so you probably need to hold meetings in a variety of ways of course you know since the since the pandemic we're doing so much more online using zoom and teams and other platforms probably some of that as well uh, so that anybody can uh, can participate at a time and a location that's convenient for them. And then you have to demonstrate explicit consideration and response to public input received during the development 
of the NTP and TFP. So I said, you don't have to agree with everything. You don't have to do everything that the public or the stakeholders have suggested, but you need to be able to document, we heard you, and here's what we did with that. And finally, the you have to coordinate with other statewide transportation planning, public involvement, and con consultation processes, which just makes sense. Look, it, it doesn't all happen in a vacuum, right? So if I'm uh, developing my MTP, well, I really ought to know what the state's plan says it's going to do, what my neighboring NPO's plan says it's going to do, and so take into account those processes. And you have to provide additional opportunity for public comment if something in the final MTP or D TIP defers significantly from the version that was originally made available for the public to comment on. So no so bait and switch. No bait and switch. You've got it. You've got to. You make a big enough change, you got to go back out and do it again and say, well, okay, we changed our mind. Here's why, and here's what we're going to do about it. Finally, and I suppose in some ways the most relevant to this training program we are involved in right here, there's the congestion management process or the CMP. Tell us a little bit more about what this is. Right. Well, this does have the term congestion right in it, right? So the CMP is a, is, it's a technical process to identify congested portions of the transportation system and whether and how to address that congestion. So, you know, and I, I emphasize the term weather here. You know, there might be a congested part of the system. It's not worth doing anything about. It isn't worth it. And we'll describe that in a, in a later uh modules when we're discussing congestion and the nature of congestion, the cost of some of the possible ways to address congestion. Some congestion is really not that bad. Some congestion maybe even is desirable at some level. Um, and so you've got to think about, you know, what are the resources available to you and is it worth doing, you know, or is it our money better spent elsewhere? And then the emphasis in the CMP, I want to be really, really clear on this, is on management and operational approaches for reducing congestion. It is not focused on construction of additional roadway capacity, particularly roadway capacity that supports single occupant vehicles, right? So this, this relates to some of that, uh, the uh, planning factors where we're trying to get better use out of our existing system and to focus on operational approaches and strategies for improving congestion without widening. So why is that the last resort? Well, I'll do something fancy here, right? So yeah. it's, it's a capacity expansion should be considered a last resort. Here's why. Compared to other congestion management strategies, building additional roadway capacity costs more to widen a road. It takes more time to complete. It brings significant environmental impact. It also brings business impacts. I mean, really some pretty big stuff, particularly if that project's going to last a long time. It, uh, and I will give credit where credit's due. Agencies, counties, cities, the state that build uh, transportation projects, and they do a, as good a job as they can to try to maintain access to the existing uh, businesses in those areas, but look, we can't pretend it doesn't have some impact, right? And it doesn't solve the underlying problems. So how many times have you seen a roadway widened, works great for a while, and then it's full again, right? And they call that induced demand. If you think of that old uh, movie, uh, yeah, uh, Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Well, that happens, right? If you build it, they will drive. They will drive. So extra lanes don't necessarily lead to less congestion. Um, you know, water flows in, uh, in a way that, that's like the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. So does traffic, right? So, um, so this is why, plus we've already made an extensive investment in our existing infrastructure. So let's just try to wring every drop every drop of efficiency out of that 
before we widen a road. And we'll get into more of this. So we've got an, a module that we are dedicating ex explicitly to the congestion management process, module 2.1. Um, so if you want more on that, you can go to 2.1, get a little more on the congestion management process. So that's all of the federally required products an MPO has to produce those uh, several reports and documents that we just talked about. It, it does seem like a lot of work, but you also said that those should be just viewed as the minimum of what an MPO can do. What, what do you mean as that's the minimum? And if that's the minimum, what's the maximum? Well, there is no maximum. The maximum is how much you can afford, right? So, you know, those are big documents. They take a lot of resources, both time, money, staffing, to, to generate, to develop, a lot of time and effort put into reaching out to public, uh, the public and stakeholders as part of those. And we have an ongoing 3C process that is also informing the decisions that are being made in the MTP and the TIP and the other documents. But what else could help? Lots of other studies, lots of other data, lots of other activities, educational programs. Um, so we might just pick any of these off the list. Again, I've got a bullet with an end more that could go on and on. Uh, you know, but if, you, if something you're really, really concerned about is crashes and safety on the roadway network, uh, you could do a specific study just on that, either in a corridor or in a sub area or on all your corridors. And the information from that study, boy, you should be making decisions in your MTP based on that, right? And so... We're looking at transportation demand management activities and transportation system management operations and management. That, that's TISMO, you know, is some of the gee whiz uh, technical stuff. Uh, what about bicyclists and pedestrians? You know, what about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, electric, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure? You know, maybe we need a separate study and then, boy, we probably ought to use whatever comes out of that study in making good decisions in our MTP. So that's what I, you know, that's what I say. That's why I say the federal requirements are the floor and everything else is, uh, is going up and beyond. And you should be spending the money you have available on what you think you need. And the responsibility of the MPO board is to not ask for more than you can afford. You can't have all these things. You don't have the money to do them. So that means if you think it's important to do and the federal planning dollars that you receive isn't enough to do it all, you got to bring some local dollars to the game because these things are important to do, but you can't afford it all with the federal resources. So you got to bring some of your own resources if you think these things are important. Well, after this discussion, I think we all have a much better understanding of what MPOs do and how they do it. Yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> I've talked a lot. Um, but there was a lot to cover. So, you know, based on what we discussed, I think, I think the viewers should be asking themselves some questions uh, listed here, maybe some other questions they think of for themselves about their own MPO. And this will help them learn more about their own MPO in the context of the discussion we just had. So, you know, what does the geography of your MPO look like? What's the MPA? How many urban areas are in there? Who's on the board? You know, who got to, who, who got a seat? Didn't get a seat. Um, you know, what does state law say about that? Because if your state law caps MPO board, membership, then maybe not everybody gets a seat just because the state law says you don't have 100 seats to give out. Uh, what are the goals and objectives in your MTP? What are the projects selected in your TIP? And how are you choosing them? Right? What methodology are you using to choose them? You should familiarize yourself with that because not everybody's doing it the same way. So how are you doing it locally? And is your MPO an effective forum for regional transportation decision making? 
Do you ever hear from the airport? Do you ever hear from the seaport? Does the city ever come in front of you? Does the county? What are they doing? And are there subjects maybe you feel should be discussed, but they aren't? Well, go talk to your staff and say, you know what? I'd like somebody to come talk to me about this. That's a perfectly legitimate uh, thing that you should be considering at home. So viewers, if you have any questions about what we discussed in this module or how things actually work at your MPO, please make sure you talk to your MPO staff and don't hesitate to reach out to AMPO or NARC. They can help you understand this as well. Thank you for watching. In the next module, we'll discuss the types and causes of congestion and the various strategies for reducing congestion. For those of you who have an interest in learning more about the congestion management process or CMP, we've made a sub-module, module, module 2.1, that provides some detail on that process. Again, it is labeled module 2.1. Thanks for watching.